Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and I learn how to be an overcomer. Spiritual feeding is just as real as physical feeding. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it is just that way that his right words feed faith. And it talks about us being nourished up in the words of faith. Wrong words can hurt you. Wrong words can put fear in you if you let them. Wrong words can rob you of your faith, of your confidence. And you want to be attuned and aware of what feeds your spirit. When something really builds you up, it really excites you and helps you, you want to hear that again. You want to listen to that again. And sometimes people talk about, well, so-and-so is my favorite preacher or my favorite minister. Well, uh, it's not, you don't want to categorize one better than another, but the Lord knows what will feed you. And he will do things through individuals that is geared more toward what you need right now. And so you want to acknowledge when it fed you, it encouraged you, it strengthened you. That's not something a man or woman could do. That was something that came through them, but not from them. And so you want to hear it again. And praise God, with the technology we have today, you can hear it again anytime you want to, most, most of the time. So take advantage. If one of these classes stands out to you more than another, watch it again. Listen to it again. Five times, ten times, twenty times. I'm telling you, uh, it's just like this. Have you eaten potatoes more than once? <laughs> Huh? I mean, if you, if you uh, only ate something one time and never again, it'd be like going to the cafeteria and you got your tray and you're going, oh, you know, bread. I had that back in 63. <laughs> so, well, after a while, you're going to starve because, no, if it fed you then, it'll feed you again. And how much more the living word of God will feed you and never fade and never wane. So... Uh, you want to feed on the same things, and when you, when you hear something or read it uh, or listen to it or watch it, and it bothers you, it shakes you, then what, what would you suggest? Quit that, right? Don't watch that again, right? Come on, be smart. Don't listen to it again. It put fear in you. You don't need anything putting fear in you. It's trying to come in at you from every angle in this dark world we live in. So don't knowingly, willingly open yourself up and say, okay. You particularly ought to watch what's called horror uh, films and movies and stuff like that. You don't need that. It's designed to scare you. It's designed to put people say, well, it's, it's, you know, it's fun. I like it. It's not good for you. Y'all listening? No, anything that puts fear in you is not helping you. It's not harmless entertainment. It's hurting you. You want something that puts joy in you, that puts faith in you. Your joy is your strength, Amen. right? Depression is your weakness. No, you want to get away from dark. You want to come to the light. Amen. Hallelujah. Get away from death. Come into life. Praise God. Well, we're into this 18th account of healing and deliverance in the ministry of Jesus, and it is the healing of the ten lepers that's recorded here in Luke 17. Let's continue today in our study. Luke 17, it says, verse 11, it came to pass 
as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and they said, this means they, they cried out with a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. For one thing, they, were, they weren't close. When he saw them, he responded. They asked for mercy. What'd they get? They got the mercy in the form of a command. A command. And the Lord, you know, he, he sees the big picture. The Spirit of God knows the whole thing. And again and again, when we ask for help, he'll give us an answer in the form of a direction. And to your limited understanding, you'll think, well, what's that got to do with that? I need this. For instance, it's tax day and you need tax money. So naturally, what do you do? Go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> now you're laughing, but what do you think he thought? You know, he thought, well, we got to pay these taxes. And the Lord says, okay, go and throw your line out. Go fishing. Well, that seems like that makes no sense. That makes no sense. But it makes no sense to you because you don't see the big picture. And it requires trust, doesn't it? And the Lord purposely won't fill in all the blanks for you. He purposely won't show you the whole thing and why. Why? Because then you'd be walking by sight. If you demand to understand before you're going to move, then you are refusing to trust. You have to do it on your terms. You have to see it. You have to understand it. Then that means you, you refuse to trust at all. But trust acknowledges I'm a little, little child compared to the Almighty. Right? I see this. <laughs> he sees this. Right? And, you know, how many know that a three-year-old can ask questions? You really can't answer them, right? You could answer them, but they still wouldn't know what you told them, right? They don't, they haven't lived long enough. They don't have the experience. They don't have the perspective. And so some things you just need to tell them, well, just do what I said, right? <laughs> huh? <laughs> and, and there are whole groups of people that say, well, you shouldn't say because I said so. Well, the Lord does, right? And there are reasons why. You should do it, do it because I said so. Why? Because some things you, just, you wouldn't understand if the Lord explained it to you for three hours. You'd still be in the same place you were. Well, what do I do? Just do what I told you. Just do what I said, right? And it's going to lead to this. There's been questions I've asked of the Lord about the Word and about things that I didn't understand. I know one thing. I, was, I so wanted to see it, but I, I studied it, and I, didn't, I couldn't put the pieces together. And sure enough, 10 years later, everybody said 10 years. Ten years. Ten, I had forgotten about it, you know. And 10 years later, one day, one afternoon, the Spirit of God just started talking to me about that, like I had asked the question that morning. Well, to him, right to the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. So what would 10 years have been like? Yeah, right? It would have been like this morning, right? But to me, and when he started communicating to me about it and showing me the answer, I realized why he didn't show me this 10 years before. I wouldn't have understood it. I had to grow for 10 years for him to be able to answer that question for me. And me under he could have answered it, but for me to understand it, I had to grow. And so... You can ask the Lord a lot of things in prayer, but folks are missing the answer because it's not obvious to them 
that it is the answer. Oh God, I need help. I need help in my marriage. I need help with my kids. I need help. And he says, go to church. <laughs> yeah, but I need help right now. You got your answer. Now, if you won't go to, if he told you to go to church, let's say tomorrow, Sunday morning or whatever, he said, get up and go to church. If you won't do that, you will never find out what you would have found out had you gone to church. The enemy is a master, the devil is a master of distraction and deception. And he works, and he's far too successful at keeping people away from their answers. And the moment the Lord directs you to do something, the enemy will immediately bring thoughts and feelings, all these reasons why it's a waste of your time to do it, why you shouldn't do it, why it makes no sense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know I was uh, in a service some years ago, and a young man that I knew was in a lot of, a lot of upheaval in his life. And uh, he came to church with us, and we were endeavoring to help him. And the pastor, that Sunday morning, about, I don't know, 10 minutes into his service, he turns, walks over to the edge of the platform where we're sitting, and starts talking, I mean, to the detail about this young man's problems and the answers to them and the word. I mean, I, to me, it was so spiritual and so uh, God. And at exactly the same time, there was a distraction, a, a noise in the back of the room. And that young man turned around and was watching it. And the pastor is telling the answer to his problems. And I thought, he's missing this. And I, I start to, to reach over and, and, and tap him, you know, you know, pay attention. And the Lord prompted me, no, leave him alone. Just watch. He wanted me to see how this works. And just about uh, another couple of minutes, the pastor, kept, he finished talking about that and he turned and walked back to the podium and this young man turned back around. He missed the whole thing and never knew it. Do you see this class? This is happening all the time. It's not that God is hiding the answers from us. It's not that he's making it hard and complicated is that people are not paying attention. And when he says something, they're treating it like it's optional, and if it doesn't make sense to them, then they don't act on it. And if you don't act on it, you're stuck right there. You never find out what would have come next. I know uh, Phyllis and I getting into the ministry, I'm looking back now, it started with listening to a set of tapes. It was that simple. The Lord prompted, and at first, that was strange and foreign to us. We thought, listening to preaching on tape, back then it was tapes. <laughs> people said, young people go, tapes? What's a tape? <laughs> yeah, magnetic groups. Interesting. And uh, we finally did, and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. We, over a period of months then, were prompted to go to a meeting. Took all the faith we had to go to that meeting out of state. Uh, we had no money. We actually had to borrow a car to, to go. Got lost every night going back to, <laughs> we're little country people. We didn't, didn't know how to navigate a city. And uh, while we were there, there was a free tour of the Bible school. Glad it was free. Because that was all we could do. And while we were taking the tour, the Lord spoke to us to come there and train for the ministry. And I won't go into all of it, but what if we had never listened to the tapes? What if we had never gone to the meeting? If you hadn't gone to the meeting, you wouldn't have took the tour. If you hadn't taken the tour. Can you see what I'm talking about? But it's, it's small things to the mind. It's, you know, Read this chapter. Uh, watch some faith school. <laughs> go to the service. Go to the meeting. Uh, go here. Talk to this one. And they, they needed help 
desperately. Their life has basically been destroyed. They need help. And they cried out, have mercy on us. Does God care, class? Does he care? Does he care? And so they can get it in their mind what should happen, but the mercy of the Most High was manifested right here. Go. Go show yourself to the priest. Whether they knew it or not, their miracle is right here, wrapped up in these words. Look with me, if you would, at uh, 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. 2 Kings chapter 5 is another uh, leper who was healed. How many think it's a good idea to just obey the Lord? Amen. Right? Just do what he said do. The first miracle that occurred in the ministry of Jesus, do you remember what that was? The changing of the water into wine in the book of John there, chapter 2 or whatever it was. What did Jesus' mother tell him? Whatever he says to you, do it. And he turns around and says, fill the water pots with water. Now, is that what you just naturally do if you're out of party supplies? <laughs> huh? Just go fill up an urn with water. But again, that's how you miss a miracle. By, by being so uh, mental and, and so... Well, that makes no sense at all. It makes perfect sense if you saw the big picture, right? But from your perspective, you're only seeing this. So you have to just obey to find out the rest of the story. Thankfully, they did, and they saw a miracle. So what's, what's one of the greatest keys to miracles that you'll ever hear? Whatever he says to you, do it. Do it. And it's not just acting on anything, it's acting on what he said to you. That's, that's the key. In 2 Kings uh, 5, it's the story of the Naaman, the captain of the host of Syria. Verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, said he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Through a contact, he found out that there were miracles happening in Samaria. A little maid told him there was a prophet there that would recover him of his leprosy. So he took 10 talents of silver, 6,000 of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. And I mean, he's, he's loaded. He's, a, he's top man over all the military in a nation. So they first sent a letter to the king, and he said, what? they think I can heal people? And he was upset. And so the prophet sends word to him, says, send him to me. And he'll know that there's a, a prophet in Israel, there's a God. And so verse 9, Naaman came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, go. That sounds familiar, don't it? Huh? Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And your flesh shall come again to you and you shall be clean. And so uh, Naaman did that and shouted all the way home. <laughs> huh? No. Uh-uh. He almost missed his miracle. That's why it's in the, in the Bible here. Naaman almost missed his miracle. Why? Naaman was wroth. What was there to be mad about? Naaman is, is enraged. He said, behold, I thought. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly the problem. You got something in your head how you thought it was going to be. And then after thinking about it for a while, you just decided, oh yeah, that's how it's going to be. And the Lord never told you it was going to be that way. Oh, this has happened so many times. People have got it in their mind. Well, this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen. And I'm sure when they hear about it, they'll go ahead and do this. And of course, that's what they ought to do. And, and then when it starts unfolding, nothing is happening like they thought it would. And people get mad. They get their feelings hurt. They get bitter. And it's so foolish because the Lord never told you it was going to happen that way. You just concocted something in your mind and then decided it was true. 
and then got mad when it didn't happen. <laughs> you know why we're laughing, class? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Let's quit it. Let's stop it. He said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He knew what's going to happen. Yeah. Because he's a general and he knows things. <laughs> yeah, but he don't know anything about God. He don't know anything about spiritual things. But he, he's got it pictured in his mind. He, they're going to roll up with all their fanfare and regalia and the prophet's going to come out probably with a, a nice warm reception of different kinds and, and he will come out and, and, and of course you know show the general the respect that he deserves and, and, and he will call on the name of his God and he will strike his hand over the place and maybe lay hands on him and, and, uh, <laughs> and the prophet didn't even come out he didn't even say hi he sent no fanfare no reception. The man himself didn't even show. Why? The Lord told him to do it this way. Why? Because Naaman needs to humble himself and quit acting like he knows everything and acknowledge there is a, a one true God and show some respect. Come on, can you see this? God does things for all kinds of reasons that you and I won't see up front. And the only way to get it right is just do what he said. Just, say it out loud, class, just, just do, what do what he said. Just do what he said. Now you would think that is so simple, and yet the moment the Lord tells you something, the fight is on. I'm telling you, the fight is on. For instance, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> then what? I'm telling you, the enemy is there, he's tempting, he's suggesting, he's telling you why. He's, well, that's how it works. And so when the Lord tells you, go dip in the river, why would he get so mad? Because the enemy's right there to push him. Look how they're dissing you. <laughs> Disrespecting you. Look at this. You know, and, he, and he goes on to say, man, I got, I got rivers, Abana and Farpar in Damascus. They're better than all the waters over here. Y'all got muddy rivers. We got nice clean water. I mean, if I'm going to take a bath, I wouldn't have to travel all the way over here. Uh, do you not know who I am? That is the point. Man, not washing them and be clean. So he turned and went away in a rage. I mean, they spun the wheels of the chariots. <laughs> Kicked up dust. They run. <laughs> He's mad. He's upset. He feels disrespected. And uh, he's running away from his miracle. Can you see this? He's going as fast as he can away from his healing. Why? Because he won't just do what he was told to do. Was it mercy for the Lord to say anything to him at all? He's been worshiping false gods. He's not a convert. He just came there to get a healing and go back to his heathen lifestyle. Does the Lord owe him something? No. Is it mercy? It's mercy for the Lord to speak to the man of God and give him the message. And notice, he didn't, even, he didn't just say, go wash. He told him what would happen, didn't he? Told him what would happen. Your flesh will come again to you and you will be clean. He's telling him the whole thing. Now we talked about, was it yesterday's class, about the timeline of faith. Right? When does faith accept it as done? Before. Everybody say before. Before it sees it. Before it feels it. That's, that's the timeline of faith. And so... He's telling him by the word of the Lord, this, if you'll go do this, it's a done deal. I'm telling you, I've seen the end of it. Your flesh is clean after you go and wash the seven times. And so they're peeling out and they're leaving and they're mad. And one of the servants came near and spoke to him as they're ripping down the road in the chariot. He says, my father, 
If the prophet had bid you do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than if he says to you, wash and be clean? He said, we brought all this money. We brought all this stuff. If he'd have said, you know, climb five mountains, if he'd have said do this, we were ready to, to go the extra thing. He said, go wash. We're here. We came all this way. Why don't we just go wash? And the general says, you know, we're here. Maybe we should just go wash. Excellent idea, sir. Yes, I think we should. I think we should. And they peeled around. And he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. Oh, come on. Do you see the word of God? According to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean because he did what the Lord told him to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when they cried out, have mercy on us. Immediately, the mercy of God flowed to them in the form of a direction. Go, show yourself to the priest, and by them acting on it, they were all healed and cleansed. And that's why we got it as an example for every generation recorded in the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And our time's up again. Say it out loud. I will not be a dummy. I will obey the Word of the Lord. Whatever he says to me, I will do it. Hallelujah. We'll see you again soon back here in Faith School. I've enjoyed being with you again this week, and we're seeing revelation of God's mercy. I know many of you are partners with us. If you want to become a partner, there's information on the screen. You can. Being a partner allows us to use our faith with you concerning your finances. We talked about how that the Lord told Peter to go cast a line and get tax money. Well, Peter actually had made a mistake in committing Jesus to do that. And when we've made mistakes in our finances, that's not the end. You can ask for mercy. And even when you've messed up terribly, God will still get you out because of his mercy. I want to pray a prayer of mercy over you. Father, for everyone who's made mistakes and got themselves in a jam, financially and materially. We're asking you, I'm asking you, they're asking you for mercy. Mercy to help, to get out, to get caught up, to pay it off, to get ahead. Thank you for having mercy on us. Go ministering spirits and influence things and cause abundance to come in. And we bind up every hindering thing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Be on the watch for it. The Lord's done it for us and others I've seen. Mercy is headed your way. We'll see you again soon back here at Faith School. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390. 